We see them everywhere. They are all around us. Throughout the ages, they have fired our imagination. They are guardians there to protect and advise us. They are also messengers there to bring news. In the Bible, they deliver one of the most important messages of all. The birth of Jesus Christ. They remain our most popular Christmas decoration. And in other religions they play a central role and have provoked centuries of argument and debate. They are rooted in ancient cultures and civilizations. In our modern soul-searching age, new faiths have emerged devoted to them. They have inspired some of the greatest works of art. They continue to inspire artists and form part of our cultural landscape. Let your imagination take flight with angels. We start with the familiar, and the most familiar representations of angels appear at Christmas. They're on display everywhere, in shops, on cards. Children love them. Angels decorate our homes and our Christmas trees. A typical school nativity presents us with a classic image of angels, dressed in white, with a tinsel halo and a pair of cardboard wings, homemade by doting parents. For many children, this is their introduction to Christ's story, and angels are there at the beginning. They appear at key events in the Bible. The angel Gabriel delivers the message of the Immaculate Conception to Mary. An angel tells the shepherds that Jesus is born. The Gospels tell us that angels are present at the crucifixion and the resurrection. They frame Jesus' life on earth. But angels are not restricted to Christianity. They can be found in other cultures and religions. Gods and spirits in early civilizations were frequently portrayed with non-human characteristics, as animals with horns, with wings. Winged figures were shown with the pharaohs of Egypt thousands of years before the time of Christ. Winged spirits represented the other world, the journey from this life to the afterlife, and so they adorn Egyptian tombs. Already we see their symbolic and decorative function. From the ancient civilizations of Egypt and the Near East, they passed into other cultures. 
In the Greek and Roman world, depictions of winged beings really took flight. Greco-Roman culture was full of semi-divine beings who resembled, at least to look at them, our familiar angels. Nike, the winged symbol of victory. Eros, a winged child with bow and arrow. What is Hermes, the winged messenger of Greek myth, but not an angel with flying shoes? Could these all be a clue as to the angel's principal function? Well, the Hebrew word that's used for angel, the root is malach, which means a messenger. For example, one of the prophets of the Old Testament is called Malachi. That simply means my messenger. That's translated into Greek as angelos and into Latin as angelus. And so we get angel. The very root of the word tells us that this is perhaps the angel's most important function as a messenger. Perhaps the most celebrated messenger angel of all was Gabriel. In the Christian story, Gabriel tells Mary that she is to bring the Son of God into the world. Gabriel's name means literally God's hero. His name and title suggest he is an angel of the highest order, an archangel. But this angel Gabriel is not restricted to the Bible. Gibril, or Jibrael, appears to Muhammad. Muhammad was meditating in a cave when Jibrael appeared and pronounced to him Ikra, meaning read. He then recited to him the verses of the Quran, the holy book of Islam. Here too, Gabriel is entrusted with delivering the word of God, bridging heaven and earth. In the ancient world, people thought of the world in three tiers. Hell is at the bottom, the earth is in the middle, and heaven is at the top. And that was the unseen world, the world of God, that was heaven. So when they looked up at the sky, they thought of the unseen world. That world was populated. For us today, of course, we don't think like that. Because when we look up there, we think of Star Wars and UFOs. But for the ancient world, it was full of beings, spirits, if you like. And those spirits came and visited us. They were all around us, as well as up there. That's what the angels could do. They could come from one world to another. They could come from the third floor to the second. During the Middle Ages, an intricate hierarchy of heaven was established. It was depicted in detailed paintings and stained glass. Where angels stood in relation to God, determined their rank within this kingdom of heaven. This model emerged not from scripture, but from the writings of the 5th century Syrian monk, Pseudo Dionysius. He divided the angels into nine orders and ranked them according to their importance. In this layered architecture of heaven, the highest angels were the seraphim and cherubim, those closest to God who exist only to worship him. Then come the virtues, workers of miracles. The thrones bring justice. and the dominions regulate the heavens. Powers protect mankind from evil, while the principalities are concerned with the welfare of nations. And finally, the archangels and angels, now seeming very lowly indeed as guides and messengers to human beings. Why did such a picture of heaven emerge? Why was there a need to organize the heavens? This hierarchy is perhaps modeled on the idea that he had of the church. Because the church for Dionysius, of course, was a hierarchy. There was a pope and a cardinal and bishops and priests, all the way down to monks, nuns and laity. 
So he modeled the angels on what he understood the church to be. And maybe he was trying to defend the hierarchical order of the church by saying, well, that's the way the angels work. That's the way we should work. This hierarchy of angels proved useful to the early church. For some, this was a convenient way of keeping God and man apart. The obsession and fixation on the nature and order of the heavens and its angels raged for centuries. Just as it reached its height in the Middle Ages, this vision of heaven was called into question. Following Dionysius, you come then to Thomas Aquinas, who lived in the 13th century, a Dominican friar who wrote about angels. He was known, after all, as the angelic doctor. And you find in his work, you know, everything you wanted to know about angels, but were afraid to ask. Do angels eat? How fast do they move? Do they die? Do they have children? How do they communicate with one another? These were questions about the nature of angels. And it's caricatured, of course, by the famous question, how many angels can stand on the end of a pin? But in the 16th century, we have the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestant reformers were not at all keen on angels. Calvin said, that's a waste of time. Go back to the scriptures. Read what the scriptures say about angels. You won't find the nature of angels being discussed in scripture, but you will find their work being discussed. The biblical account of Gabriel's visit to Mary bears no visual description of the angel. Neither does Mary remark that she has seen an angel. Mary hears the angel. So how do we know what angels look like? Over the ages, artists have had to visualize angels. And in doing so, they have affected the way we see angels forever. But the greatest trend in artistic depictions, be it in stained glass, paintings, or statues, is to humanize them. This has raised a whole host of issues and questions. The Hebrew Bible usually describes angels as men when they appear on earth, so they don't usually have wings. But we find that when they're shown in art from the 4th century onwards, that this starts to change. This is, of course, the time that the Roman state adopts Christianity as its state religion. And you find that the idea of the angel gets very bound up visually with Greco-Roman goddesses like winged victories, which are female goddesses in female robes with wings. So as art develops, you tend to find that you've got the male form, but wearing a sort of feminine, beautiful robe and with wings. So there's a sort of increasing feminization of the angel. They're not made totally feminine either. I mean, they're very rarely actually shown as women. They don't have breasts, but they seem to develop into an ideal of beauty, which is quite feminine. The Bible names Gabriel, Michael, Raphael, Iriel. These are male names, but rarely would you get a little boy today playing the part of the angel in the nativity. Perhaps it's safer to assume that angels are sexless. This avoids a whole host of embarrassing questions and thorny issues. Great Spirit. We ask for your love, your light. Today, your angels are no longer restricted to organized religion. We ask for the room to be filled with angels. In some cases, they have bypassed religion altogether. Angel group meetings provide a new form of belief. Smell their fragrance. And most of all, know that they are here. Some are scornful of this modern-day spirituality, but there are countless stories of guardian angel rescues, warnings, and interventions. Angels are even said to have averted car crashes. I heard a voice say to me that we had to move from the fast lane into the slow lane. We were starting to go through the tunnel. Then we actually noticed there was a car that had stopped across both lanes. Now, we couldn't see that from where we were. 
But the angels could see, and they knew that had we been in that lane, travelling at the speed we were, well, I probably wouldn't be here to relay this story to you. I've seen angels and felt angels since I was about three years old. Yes. Never, ever doubt your angels are always with you. That's right. Always. As a human being, we need to have a reason for something. Maybe it's a scientist in us. We want to know that things can't just happen by coincidence. Because if everything is a coincidence, then we have no control. If there's something there that we can ask for and that will bring help when we need it, then that gives us a comfort. Everybody needs to talk to their angels. The modern angel is a protector, a friend. New faiths have spawned their own industry. There are countless publications on the subject. There are angel shops and boutiques. Angels can decorate your home as well as renew your spirit. America, home to the city of angels, Los Angeles, an angelology has reached new heights. Here, mass angels seminars are held, where psychics use the power of angels to heal and cleanse. The prophets of the modern age? Oh, angels are absolutely real, I have no doubt. As a clairvoyant, I see them around every single person. What happens, though, is not everybody listens to their angels, or we wouldn't have any cruelty or evil or even problems in this world. My work involves writing the messages I get from the angels and then I give workshops where I teach people that angels are real and do something called angel therapy which involves helping people to release their fears, release toxins from their body and their mind and just generally to feel better with the help of the angels. Archangel Michael, we ask that you cut any cords of fear Letting go of guilt, which Michael says is the lowest energy, which literally clips our wings. All right, is there anyone here who has a question for the angels about their love life? <laughs> come on up, let's what give them a mean? hand. Hi. Come on up here, come on. Come oh, on. come on up. Yeah, you have to come right here. Oh, my God. Yes, you, you didn't read that in the program brochure? <laughs> okay, hear it. I want to meet somebody that um, that I can love and will love me back with the same energy and passion. God, I'm looking for somebody with passion, please. Passion. Passion's nice, yeah. Passion for life, passion for love, just passion. Beautiful. The angel is reaching for, it's supposed to be a star, but it's shaped like a heart. Oh, oh wow. So what's the message for Garrett then? Open his heart and let him reach for his heart to another heart. Thank you. You're welcome. What beautiful messages. Beautiful. It means peace that I can go on with my life to know that I have some other comfort and divine guidance with God and with the angels also. What they show me is not just this partner, but there's kind of a stack of friends that didn't, didn't live up. Like you've trusted people, and you've done good for them, and then you've been disappointed. Everybody I ever cared for has always hurt me and stabbed me in the back. So That's I feel like that, I can't trust anybody or yeah. love anyone. They just showed me a gun and a bullet. One of my friends was killed by another friend, one of my best friends. With a gun? Recently, okay. my, my best friend, her, her friend got killed recently. You deserve good, you deserve peace, you deserve love. You are a beloved child of God who's your real mother and father. And now take in a deep breath, and on the exhale, let go of all toxins. Go. I felt that. It's just a, a wonderful way to live, to have angels in your life. Gently ask your third eye to open Awaken and see love. Whatever you get is perfect. Bless it. Beautiful. 
The idea of a protecting god is an ancient one. The Greeks believed that each person was assigned a protector for life at birth. The Romans similarly believed that each woman had a guardian angel called Juno, and each man, one called Genius. Jewish tradition has it that each person is accompanied through life by two angels, a good angel to guide them and a bad one to tempt them. This idea was taken up by Christians, and belief in guardian angels boomed during the Middle Ages. Today, Catholic children are still taught to say a prayer to their guardian angel. In the modern age, the idea of the guardian angel, the comforting angel, has become the most popular one. Angels adorn headstones in our cemeteries. They accompany us from this world to the next. desire to believe in a protective force is more powerful than ever. It's surely no coincidence that battlefield nurses during the First World War were commonly known as angels of mercy. But angelic encounters of a more supernatural kind were not unheard of either. The scars of the battle still remain an all too vivid reminder of past horrors. In August 1914, the British and German armies faced each other at Mons, Belgium. What followed was a fierce battle, culminating in the surprise victory of the British over their superior opponents. The odds had been stacked against them. Almost immediately, Rumors circulated. Had there been some kind of heavenly intervention? In Britain, the press leapt on the story of the victory. There had been reported visions of angels, a savior for the troops. The legend of the Angel of Mons was born. Was it a miracle? A sign of divine intervention on the side of the Allies? Or had the truth lost out to myth? Belief can often be stronger than fact. A holy war is seen as a just war, and angels have joined their ranks. And leading the heavenly armies, we find one general in particular, the archangel Michael. His name means who is as God, and this name was the war cry of the heavens in the battle between good and evil. He's been adopted by many as a symbol or mascot. At Castel Sant'Angelo in Rome, Michael casts his protective gaze over the eternal city, standing guard, ready to defend its people. The Archangel Michael is shown as a warrior angel. He's often shown wearing armor and is 
intended to be quite an imposing figure. This is someone who is vitally involved in the battle against the devil, and he needs to look like someone who actually can protect humankind. Often paintings show him defeating the devil, trampling on him or having cut off his head, and it's very explicit so that we know he's out there fighting for us. Michael is also often shown with a set of scales. He uses these to weigh the souls of humankind in the balances. They're actually weighed against little devils to decide where that human soul will go, to heaven or hell. Michael's role as protector of the forces of good was echoed in the 1950s, when Pope Pius XII made him patron saint of policemen. Michael is the ultimate protecting angel. But what kind of protecting role do angels have in today's culture? In Gateshead, in the north of England, stands a very imposing protector. Anthony Gormley's sculpture, The Angel of the North. The northeast of England is very much about regeneration. It has been for decades, and I think you can really put the angel as a, a milepost for uh, regeneration. The people of the area have taken it to their hearts. It is symbolic. They always see it when they're coming back on the train or on the road on the A1. They see it as a welcoming sign back to Gateshead, back to Tyneside, back to the northeast of England. And uh, it's interesting that if you had asked a child in this area ten years ago to draw an angel, they probably would have drawn an angel with feather wings. Today, they'll probably draw an angel with steel wings. So it's actually changed what has become a traditional image. Angels don't only protect individuals and armies, but whole regions. From Rome to Gateshead, winged figures watch over us. Angels fly above us. They bring heaven closer to our world. But angels are not always what they seem. Young American soldiers returning from the Second World War established one of the most notorious clubs in the world. We're part of society that doesn't fit in with the rest of society in a mainstream concept. There's an underworld wherever you go on this planet. When the veterans came back from World War II, members of the bomber wing and the uh, paratrooper wing were uh, a little displaced, uh, probably didn't feel like they fit in too well, and uh, you know, continued uh, the camaraderie and brotherhood that they uh, you know, had developed. Uh, flying missions over Europe. If you speak to anybody uh, that uh, goes through a period of time in their life uh, when uh, life's value doesn't uh, seem to hold much value. Back in those days, they didn't uh, have uh, names for it. Uh, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, you can sit down and talk to a psychologist and come up with all types of different uh, theories and ideas. But, uh, you know, these guys were uh, patriotic, courageous man. Rebellion is what uh, initially drew me to the Hells Angels. We've uh, been bombed, uh, had hand grenades thrown in here, uh, uh, you know, been gunfights out in the street. Uh, we've uh, been the target of uh, state and federal uh, you know, prosecutions, which uh, all started out uh, as a big bang. And uh, the name itself, is a huge statement. But who were the original Hells Angels? These are the fallen angels, and the accounts of angels falling are full of sex and violence. In one account, Lucifer is jealous of God's love towards Adam and leads a revolt against him. The concept of a fallen angel is based, of course, on scripture. 
the first letter of Peter talks about God punishing sinful angels by sending them down into hell. There is a tradition also that angels had intercourse with humans and that didn't please God. There's the story in Isaiah of the fall of Lucifer. Lucifer was a good angel, the bearer of light, that's what his name means. But because he disobeys God and he becomes proud, pride is the problem, he tries to get as good as God, he is thrown out of heaven. The ultimate hell's angel is of course the devil. The name is thought to have come from the Greek words for throw out and spirit, diabolos and demon. In the Roman world, they became synonymous with evil forces and entered Christian writing as a dark and negative spirit. In the Bible, the devil is portrayed as a serpent or dragon, the leader of all the fallen angels. He's the tempter of Adam and Eve and later of Christ himself. In the Quran, he's better known as al Shaitan, the classic tempter. Through frightening visual representations, the devil and fallen angels have haunted our imagination. The easiest way that artists have been able to depict the differentiation between good and evil angels is quite simple. It's quite an easy trick to do. You just change the color, give him horns, protruding eyes, and sometimes add a tail. The thing immediately becomes evil and sinister. Angels invoke terror and fear, and the good angels can be just as frightening as the bad. Angels can be quite frightening. Martin Luther, for example, prayed that he would never meet an angel. And when you look at the Bible stories, you can understand that. When Jacob, for example, saw the ladder from heaven to earth and angels going up and down on it, he was terrified. And he said, this is a place of fear. This must be the house of God. But fear comes into it. The women, when they went to the grave after the resurrection, found it empty and angels standing, guarding the grave. And the first thing the angel says to the women is, don't be afraid. There must be a reason for people to be afraid of angels. They're not necessarily going to bring good news. They can be quite terrifying. Angels can be good and they can be bad. The good can be terrifying and the bad can be very alluring. Misconceptions abound. really don't think about Satan or associate uh, any of my activities with any type of uh, satanic ideology or philosophy or anything that has to do with that. As to us being a, you know, a large criminal entity is, you know, it's, it's preposterous. I think that any organization that's been around, you know, near to 60 years have uh, had problems. You know, we do activities all the time for people. You know, we are uh, an intricate part of this community. Uh, you know, whether the city fathers want to realize it or recognize it, uh, I find that uh, Hell's Angels uh, can be very uh, benevolent. Angels are the product of theological imagination, cultural imagination, mythical imagination, artistic imagination, all mixed together in a rich melting pot. There can be four-headed, six-winged and multi-eyed angels, or of course, one of the most abiding and popular images of all. The angel is a cute, childlike cherub. They decorate Christmas cards and have also made it onto our Valentine cards. These quintessential romantic Renaissance babies are often portrayed as winged young boys who strike at the hearts of couples in love.
Allora, gli angeli vengono rappresentati nel Rinascimento come eh, bambini eh, perché appunto c'è questa ricerca eh, del bello ideale e i bambini sono eh, l'emblema delle eh, proporzioni tornite, eh, comunque armoniose, eh, dove la muscolatura non è così accentuata e quindi ehm, la pittura può realizzare dei passaggi chiaroscurali molto delicati e eh, poi comunque la tenerezza eh, per eccellenza, la visione del bambino e quindi la figura angelica eh, rappresenta un po' eh, l'icona iconografia ideale nel bambino. Cupid is the most famous of the little angels. He is portrayed as a frolicking child, innocent and mischievous. But he carries a deadly weapon. The most dangerous thing in his possession in fact was the bow and the arrow and they could be used to pierce the heart of anybody and therefore um, you, he could do it surreptitiously because you weren't conscious of a child having this power so it was again linked up with mythology and it had an element of danger and wickedness therefore that's why the cherub always smiles The cherubs also work visually very well with certain subjects, like, for example, the Virgin Mary with the Christ child on her lap. It seems very natural, then, that the Christ child is playing with other little children who fly down to get involved in whatever he's doing. We have to remember that when a lot of these paintings were made, many, many babies died. And even though the idea that angels are dead babies' souls is heretical according to the church, this perhaps was something of a comfort. It certainly also makes these paintings appealing to us even now. Cherubs are actually the cherubim, the second highest rank of angels. In scripture, they are assigned the task of guarding the gates of Eden after Adam and Eve are thrown out. Hardly innocent babies. The cherubim and seraphim were often shown with one, two, or three pairs of wings. But artists have freely embellished and adapted the form, function, and type of angels. Artists have relegated the cherubim to the ranks of decorative children or putti. Over time, we have grown comfortable with this image of angels as perfect, youthful beings, babies, without the human flaws of flesh and blood. This image reached a peak of sublime grace during the Renaissance age. The angel became increasingly ornamental, decorative, and cute. Angels perform a number of functions and assume many identities. They carry messages from God. They guide. They offer protection and comfort. But there are also the darker elements, the fallen angels, the angels at war. Whether it's Caravaggio's ethereal beings or Anthony Gormley's Angel of the North, they seem to have one thing in common, wings. Surprisingly, the earliest depictions of Christian angels don't have wings. These are images in the catacombs of Rome, dating from the 2nd century AD. 
there was little means of identifying such beings as angels. Not until the 5th century did Christian angels begin to be regularly depicted with wings. And from then on, they would rarely be found without them. I think angels have wings for two reasons. One, so that we, the viewers, will recognize that they are angels. When they're described in the Bible, it's often not clear to the people that they're interacting with that these are angels. But of course, when we look at visual representations of those stories, we need to know who is the mortal and who is the angel. So wings are a way of making that very clear. Wings are also a really marvellous way for artists to give vent to their wildest imaginings. They can be quite naturalistic and look like birds' wings, or they can be fantastic, flowing curls and uh, really extraordinary creations. So I think artists love the angels' wings because they can go so far with them. Theologians, along with artists, sculptors and authors, have grappled with the problem of how to bridge the earthly and heavenly worlds. How to imagine and envisage these celestial beings that do not belong to our world. There are winged messengers in Egypt. There are winged messengers in Greece and Roman mythology. So it wasn't anything new. The gods had angels with wings. And maybe that was the best way of transport. After all, if you believed in the three-tiered universe, how do you get from one place to the other? How do you get from heaven to earth? Well, the quickest way to do it was by flying. So angels are depicted with wings. Does the fact that angels have wings reflect our own aspirations to fly? After wings, the most frequently depicted feature is the halo, a nimbus, a circular crown of light denoting holiness. Another convenient way for artists to draw attention to the divinity of angels and to distinguish them from humans. In the Bible, angels were created when light was created at the dawn of creation. Italy, the cradle of the Renaissance, and angels are everywhere. Christian kings, emperors, religious orders, and wealthy merchants generated a massive angel industry. Le principali caratteristiche del Rinascimento nell'arte e nell'architettura vedono lo studio, la ricerca eh, nei gesti, nei colori, nelle espressioni della ricerca del bello ideale. Vengono rappresentati da eh, autori importantissimi come Raffaello, Leonardo, Michelangelo, nelle varie eh, sfaccettature dell'arte, nell'architettura, nella pittura, eh, nella scultura, eh, c'è un ritorno alla eh, bellezza ideale dovuta anche allo studio approfondito che in questi anni eh, viene dato all'antichità. The Renaissance is a time when there are all sorts of wealthy and influential people that have got money to spend who are commissioning so many paintings. And some of it is about meaning, but some of it is about showing off and just having fantastic things to put on the walls of the palace that you're just building. They also wished for status. Statues and various other artifacts were being discovered and they wanted copies of them. The easiest way to do it was to employ artists or sculptors to make exact copies of these things. The artists did what they were told. There was no thing such as creativity, it was repetition of earlier art. Therefore they could rule and tell you exactly what they wanted to do. There was in some cases a political element as well, especially the Medicis. The Medicis used artists not only to produce beautiful pictures, but also to convey their political status. One artist in particular stands out, Caravaggio. His angels are painted with an extraordinary degree of realism. The 
ordinary everyday people who modeled for him were the basis for these sacred figures. Anche nella figura di San Matteo e l'Angelo, del dipinto eh, che fa parte della serie di San, della chiesa di San Luigi di Francesi, eh, l'Angelo interviene direttamente eh, nella scena rappresentata, tanto che eh, la prima opera realizzata da eh, Caravaggio, appunto rappresentante San Matteo e l'Angelo, fu rifiutata eh, dagli ecclesiastici perché l'Angelo aiutava direttamente San Matteo direttamente nell'azione dello scrivere. Even today in Italian towns and cities, angels are everywhere. The angels of Botticelli, Raffaello and Michelangelo remain as marketable as ever. All over the world, angels continue to inspire artists. The reason for coming somewhere like this, to draw uh, and to look at the angels that have been carved here and placed high up in the chapel there, is feeding the imagination. The subject is an interesting subject, in a sense, because we've created them somewhat in our own image. And it's that looking at ourselves, or at a better version of ourselves, which is one of the attractions that angels have to us all, that here is a human being in a more idealized state than we are. Perhaps we have athletes in the same way in this day and age, and models and film stars and pinups in the same way that people in the past had angels. They are, in a sense, more than people that we look up to. Children are fascinated by angels, and from a very early age, they instinctively know how to draw them. With wings, a halo, white robes, and with light. Angels in heaven express joy much as humans do on earth. by singing, dancing, and playing music. Countless images show them in choirs. The hierarchy of angels grouped them into three choirs. Again, this was proof of an organized, tiered structure in heaven. The joyful, harmonious choirs of angels sang in praise of God with one voice, one sound. Angels get shown in choirs and playing music, I think, for two reasons. Partly because it is there in the Bible. Psalm 150 actually describes the use of timbrels and drums and voices and harps and that sort of thing. But also, of course, it relates to the people who are going to look at these images. It relates to how we celebrate and honor special occasions, special people on earth by playing music. Angels were given the popular instruments of the Renaissance age to play. The lute, the fiddle, the flute, the sackbut were all deployed as part of a celestial orchestra. The harp has perhaps become the instrument most associated with angels. But the lute, the prince among courtly instruments, is also often shown. This instrument was frequently used to accompany the voice during the Renaissance. Whose voice were the angels accompanying? God's voice. But just as angels could deliver bad as well as good news, so the music is not always something we want to hear. Gabriel, it is said, will announce the last judgment with an apocalyptic trumpet blow. It will hardly be a comforting sound.
Today, we are surrounded by angels. In religion, in art, and in culture. There is a deluge of information about them. Their history, their ability to guide and protect. There are countless definitions, descriptions, interpretations, and even encounters. They are as popular as ever. Our fascination with them shows no sign of diminishing. In today's popular culture, they still inspire writers and filmmakers, bestsellers and blockbusters. What is Superman after all but an angel in a red cape sent here to protect us? A modern Michael. Angels are now a religion in themselves. They are adored, they are worshipped. Oh, angels are absolutely real. I have no doubt. As a clairvoyant, I see them around every single person. The material world hasn't delivered all that we want. So the secular age hasn't been all that successful. People are looking for something else. You find this in what is known as New Age spirituality. It isn't necessarily Christian spirituality, but it is a spirituality. It's to do with the unseen. So the belief in the unseen is there. They're part of our heritage. They're part of our mythology. They're part of our history. They're part of our tradition. They are symbols. They have also been used as protectors, as reminders, as guardians, and are always present, according to some people, by your side. I think perhaps some people, when we talk about angels now, think of them as a little bit cliched, perhaps particularly where art is concerned and commercial art now. There's so much on every Christmas card, and perhaps visually tied in a bit with fairies. Maybe they don't seem like such a serious or important source of inspiration for us now. And yet it's clear all around us that they are, that they do still inspire people. One question remains unanswered. Do angels actually exist? They exist for those who believe in them.